just before we start this video, I'd like to say a big thank you to Pascal Mod, a uh, name appearing on the screen at the moment, who was very much kind enough to provide a series of photos of some scale models of the Gato class that he has made and uh, taken for the channel. So thank you very much, and uh, hopefully this will help fill out uh, Photos of a class that obviously spending most of its time underwater is perhaps less well documented photography wise than some ships are. With that said, let's get on with the video. The Gato class was the tail end of a design lineage started in the late World War I period. The effectiveness of a relatively cheap submarine at destroying or crippling much larger and more expensive warships had of course been realised. But the submarines at the time were not capable of keeping up with the fleet, either running on the surface, or especially when submerged, which meant that their use in fleet engagements was limited to pre-planned trip lines, which, as the Germans repeatedly found out, could be confounded entirely simply by the enemy fleet moving in a slightly different direction or at a slightly different speed to what they'd anticipated. It also meant that large amounts of subs had had to sail in advance of any fleet movement, which gave the enemy a greater chance to realise something was going on by direct visual observation or intercepted radio traffic. And so the idea of a fleet submarine had developed. This would be a sub which would sail with the fleet and then move ahead of it and scout. They would also report on enemy force dispositions and ideally also attack them. In this respect, the battle line speed of 21 knots dictated by the standard battleships worked in the US Navy's favour, since a fleet sub would only have to be about this fast, as opposed to trying to be much faster to keep ahead of a Queen Elizabeth class or battle cruiser line, uh, such as would be the case for the Royal Navy. In the UK, the Royal Navy had experimented with not a great amount of success and a spectacular amount of failure with the K and M class submarines, whilst in the US, the AA-1 or T class and the first few boats of the V class had played around with the concept, and whilst none of these attempts could have been said to have successfully met the objectives, the lessons learned in each iteration were taken and then developed further with each new submarine attempt. Further interwar submarine classes would gradually expand in size and capability, with each class now being operationally useful in some respect and working on bettering other aspects of submarine design and operation. Eventually, the stars would align and the two decade long legacy of trial and experimentation brought about the design and construction of the Gato class, the United States Navy's first fully successful fleet submarine design. The immediately preceding classes, the Tambor and Gar class boats, had almost hit the right spot, and as a result the Gatos would differ only slightly from these designs. But the changes made would prove vital. Firstly, the submarine was slightly longer, allowing the engine room to be divided into two. This gave the subs the ability to retain some power, even in the event of damage causing a leak in an engine room, since that engine room could be evacuated if needed, but the other half would be able to remain operational, as opposed to losing all power to a single leak. The other change was an increase in the calculated strength of the pressure hull, which then allowed dives down to about 300 feet, a 20% increase over previous classes, which would allow for better escape and evasion, as well as more durability in the face of, de face of depth charge attacks when at shallower depths. The outer and pressure hulls were separate along the centre of the sub, with the two merging at either end. The submarines would be quite large, at over 300 feet long and nearly 2,500 tonnes displacement when submerged, which did make them slower to dive compared to a German Type 7 U-boat, but their size also meant that they were considerably longer ranged than almost any other submarine in service at the time, which was very handy for operations in the Pacific or prolonged patrols in smaller oceans. During the war, improvised changes to the sub's ballast tanks and pumps would almost halve the overall dive time, which would significantly increase their survivability. 
needless to say, their size also meant they were not the most agile of submarines ever to take to the ocean depths. On the other hand, again directly due to their size, the Gatos could fit numerous crew comforts that smaller boats could not, which would vastly extend their effective operational range. This was vitally important in the Pacific above all other theatres, because it didn't really matter too much if your sub could cross the entire Pacific three times over on a single tank of fuel, if the crew were completely exhausted and dead on their feet halfway through the first crossing, since an exhausted crew would be one that made mistakes, and would be far more likely to fall victim to enemy sub-hunters as a result. In this regard, the Gatos managed to install air conditioning to regulate the interior temperature, refrigerated storage which extended the lifespan of perishable foods, and substantial capacity in freshwater distilling units. There was also almost no need to share bunks, and taken in combination, all of these made them virtual cruise liners of the submarine world, and would allow these vessels to regularly operate on patrols of well over two months without significant detriment to the crew. By removing moisture from the air as part of this process, the air conditioning units also massively cut down on condensation, which doesn't tend to mix too well with lead-acid batteries or electrical equipment, and this in turn would increase the reliability of the boat's systems. After the first few boats had an initially terrible engine installed, the bulk of the class would be fitted, or refitted, with replacement diesels which would work quite well, getting the subs up to 21 knots on the surface, whilst the batteries would get them up to about 9 knots when submerged. A total of 77 submarines of this class would be built, all of which were named after various fish species, as was the tradition for US Navy subs at the time. The initial armament consisted of six forward and four aft torpedo tubes for a total of 24 torpedoes, plus a 3-inch deck gun. Although, even on a sub, the 40mm Bofors and 20mm Orlikans would inevitably appear during the war, along with the replacement by and large of the 3-inch gun with a 5-inch anti-aircraft weapon. Unfortunately, their initial main weapon was the legendarily broken Mark 14 torpedo, which meant that for about a third of the war, the sub's most effective weapon was actually the deck gun, which kind of obviated the point of being a submarine in the first place. Eventually, the Bureau of Ordnance was dragged kicking and screaming into reality and the Mark 14 was fixed just in time for them to issue the Mark 18 electrical torpedo, which had the wonderful tendency to run in a nice big circle back to the submarine that had launched it. Eventually, likely under threat of extreme violence on the part of the surviving subcrews, the Bureau of Ordnance was forced to fix that little issue as well, and the lethality of the Gatos took a quantum leap. Somewhat ironically, given that the US Navy had finally perfected the fleet submarine, their wartime service would see virtually none of this role, as the Imperial Japanese Navy had handily sunk most of the US Navy's battle line at Pearl Harbor, and with them went the idea of a battle fleet support submarine. Luckily, the qualities of extreme endurance, good speed, and heavy armament turned out to be perfect for the new task of converting the Japanese Merchant Marine into a wide-ranging array of marine conservation projects by sending them down to the bottom to provide homes for a large variety of marine species. And who says war is entirely bad for the environment? Gato-class submarines would go on to achieve the top three tonnage sunk figures for any US submarine in the war, and would also achieve a number of notable kills. The USS Albacore sank the Japanese aircraft carrier Taiho, Barb managed to sink a passing train and acquired a rocket launcher from somewhere, which it would then use in shore bombardment missions at night, Kavala sank the Japanese aircraft carrier Shikaku, COD would conduct the only in intentional submarine-to-submarine -submarine rescue so far in history, Finback would rescue, at the time, Lieutenant Junior Grade George H.W. Bush, who would of course go on to be the future President of the United States, after his Avenger torpedo bomber managed to crash in the Pacific. USS Harder turned the tables on its hunters, sinking a total of five enemy destroyers. 
Unfortunately for the Gatos, although most of them would survive the war, their 300-foot test depth was significantly behind a number of other nation submarines, as well as later American subs such as the Baleo and Tench classes. And so, with a few exceptions, most were rapidly decommissioned and scrapped after only a few years in active service, with a few being retained for experimental work, such as developing hunter-killer submarines, and one, the Tunny, becoming the first nuclear missile sub in US service when it was given the Regulus cruise missile in 1953, shortly before becoming a transport sub once the Polaris program got off the ground. A few others would go overseas to serve with Allied navies, including, hilariously enough, a few that were sent to Japan. A total of six Gato-class submarines survive in a publicly viewable condition. USS Kavala is at the Seawolf Park near Galveston in Texas, in a later configuration than the World War II fit-out. USS Kabir is in the Wisconsin Maritime Museum in, surprisingly enough, Wisconsin. USS Cod is on display in Cleveland, and this submarine is actually still fully ocean capable, and can still be used for live action filming at sea. USS Croker is on display in Buffalo in New York, again like the Kavala, in its hunter-killer configuration from later in life. USS Drum is on display at the Battleship Memorial Park in Alabama, and USS Silversides is on display in, I am probably going to horribly butcher this, but anyway, Muskegon in Michigan. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.